Chapter 12, Part 2 I half carried a stumbling stay-do down the hill until we're out of sight in the forest near the tool shed. You have to stay very quiet now, I whisper in his ear. You can't cry again like you did on the hill, or they'll hear you and come get you. Do you understand? I hate to see the look of fear darkening his eyes, but at least I know he'll be quiet. I put a hand on his back and give it a little rub. Okay, I'm going to set a fire somewhere to distract everyone and then let Khadijah out, I say. You'll be okay here. He frowns, but eventually nods. I slink to the edge of the camp. The bosses seem to be finishing their business with the pistor, and the boys are milling around. Too many eyes. I consider setting the far groves on fire, but the leaves around my feet are heavy and damp. A fire there would be difficult to light and easy to put out. I drum my fingers against the tree in front of me, considering. Other than for work, I can't think of any time the bosses leave the clearing except to go to their house to sleep. Their house. And with that thought, I'm off, loping through the bush at the edges of the camp like a soundless shadow, heading for the boss's house. I make it there in record time. Not able to believe what I'm doing, I light their little propane burner with the matches on the counter. Fingers shaking, I turn the flame up as high as it will go, and then I drag the three mattresses from their bedrooms and lean them so that they're over the flame. The fibers curl away from the heat, blackening and a horrible smell fills the house. When I see orange flames licking the stuffing, I leave. On my way out the door, I grab a shirt for Sadu and the rest of the packet of matches. Hand shaking, I tuck the boss's wadded shirt into my belt and put the book of matches in my pocket. Then, ducking under the billowing black smoke filling the house, I race off again into the bush. By the time I've made it to where I left Sadu, the pillar of black smoke has caught the attention of the people in the clearing. For a moment I pause to appreciate the sight of the bosses panicking, herding the boys into the sleeping hut, and running with the pasteur in the direction of the smoke. But then I snap to attention. Time has just gotten more important. I'll be back. Stay quiet and be careful. Then I'm sprinting to the bush where I saw the toolbox. I pause there, panting, my heart racing, as if I'd been running for kilometers, though my gut is screaming at me to go. I slow and take one last look around to make sure no one's sitting at the edges of the camp. I examine every corner and look extra carefully at the pasteur's truck. Everything seems deserted. I open the toolbox and pull out a hammer. Every nail that I pull out of the boards makes a terrible groaning sound and I grimace at the amount of noise I'm making but I don't stop until enough of them are loose for me to crawl inside. I hope I'm right, I think briefly. Khadija, I call softly. When there's no response, I make my way to the front of the shed. She's lying beyond the light from the hole I've created and she's not answering. I crawl carefully over to her and roll her toward me. New swelling is dis disfiguring her face. I touch her cheek gently then remind myself that there will be time to worry about her once we're gone. I turn and root around in the shadows until I find a machete. Then I saw through the ropes binding her legs. The rope frays apart and I untangle the ends. Legs matter more than arms when you're running, so I do them first. But then I get to work on her arms and hands. I tell myself it's because I might need her to do something as we run, but really it's because I just can't stand to see anyone tied up anymore. When I'm halfway done, she stiffens under my fingers. Khadija, it's okay. It's me, Amadou. Amadou, you came back? Her voice is a cracked whisper, but I smile to hear it anyway. Yes, now keep quiet until I get you out. She doesn't say anything, but I feel the tension go out of the muscles in her arms. I untie her hands and then, before stepping away, give her fingers a quick squeeze of reassurance. She struggles to her feet. As we shuffle through the shed, I take one more look at all the things that have made up my life on the farm for the past two years. Tools for cutting, tools for pruning, oil for motors, oil for cooking, chains for machines, chains for people. I only realize I've been chewing on my lip when I taste blood. I stop. Machete, rope, poison, chain. 
Anger curls in my stomach. I want to make them all vanish. The faded label on the side of the fertilizer drum with a picture of flames on it flutters. Even though we don't need a second fire, I decide we're going to have one. Get into the woods. Sadu's there, I whisper to Khadija. I give her a gentle push and reach through the hole for the toolbox. When I found a screwdriver, I head over to the giant metal drums. I center the screwdriver on the picture of the flames and pound it into the drum with the base of my machete. Then I pull the screwdriver out and do it again and again. I throw the screwdriver into the spreading puddle that's leaking out of the punctured drum and uncap the cooking oil and the machine oil and pour them into the whole mess. The fumes are overwhelming and I cough and pull the collar of my shirt over my nose. It doesn't really filter out that much, but it makes me feel better about what I'm breathing. I crawl out through the hole, machete clenched in my hand, and fingers shaking, pull out the matches. When the first little red head scratches to life, I rip a sleeve off of the shirt I took from the boss's house and use the match to light it. Then I toss the tiny fireball into the mess of poison and oil I've made and peer in the hole after it as it lands with a splash in the puddle on the floor. For a second, nothing happens. And then with a whoosh, the air around the drum catches fire. The flames, unnaturally bright, flare toward me. Plumes of dark smoke billow out the hole in the wall. I scramble away as fast as I can. The heat on my back pushes me past the edge of the forest, where Khadija's watching, mouth hanging open. I grab her elbow and steer her through the bush to the place I left Sadu, but when we get to the clearing, he's not there. Panic floods me, and I start to hunt furiously through the bushes. Sadu! Sadu! I whisper shout. Khadija stands a little way off to the side, rocking slightly on her feet, looking around the area with an unfocused look. Her oval face is lumpy with swelling, and her braids are frayed so badly that stray twists of her hair surround her like a furry halo. I whip from side to side, looking for tracks, but we've chewed up the area so much with all our moving about that there's no clear trail. My frustration gets the better of me. Why aren't you helping me look? I bark at Khadija. Because I just found him, she says softly. Her answer pulls me up short. I wasn't expecting that. Where? Khadija raises a hand and points the trees into the camp. I follow her finger and curse roundly. Because Sadu is not looking for me, not waiting for me. Sadu is not being quiet or careful like I told him to. With only one arm, Sadu is standing in the middle of the clearing for anyone to see, pounding away at the door of the sleeping hut with a shovel, trying to let the other boys out.